So I'm looking forward to giving the Banting lecture tomorrow. I will be covering a fair amount of ground in terms of highlighting various aspects of what adipose tissue does for us in terms of systemic homeostasis. Of course, we know about general adipose tissue physiology and the dysfunction of adipose tissue in the context of inflammation, insulin resistance. One of the things that we have increasingly appreciated over the last couple of years is the fact that adipose tissue in its dysfunctional state can become quite fibrotic and that fibrosis is actually a direct causative agent of local insulin resistance and, and inflammation in that sense as well. But if we look at the tissue now, not sort of in the context of its tissue autonomous effects, but much rather on the effects on the entire system, the key points that I will discuss are adipose tissue as a source for secretory factors, we refer to them as adipokines specifically, and there are, of course, a few well-known ones out there. There are inflammatory factors, there is leptin, and then my personal favorite over many years has been this protein called adiponectin. And using adiponectin as an example, we will talk about a lot of physiology related to this protein, which taught us an awful lot about adipose tissue physiology in general. Adiponectin is a insulin sensitizer. It's an excellent biomarker for existing metabolic disease. It's, it turns out to be inversely related to fat mass, which is a bit counterintuitive. More adiponectin reflects better insulin sensitivity. It's an excellent prospective biomarker as well. And with that, it really has highlighted a whole bunch of new therapeutic areas that we're a group now sort of get into more and more, including effects on lipids, systemic lipid homeostasis. And the one category we'll touch upon tomorrow very specifically is a broad category of rather specialized lipids called sphingolipids and the subspecies there of the ceramides. Now these ceramides have been implicated in as a causative agent of insulin resistance, so we want to lower ceramides. And adiponectin happens to do so very effectively through a number of different mechanisms. It turns out that a lot of anti-diabetic treatment regimens, PPO gamma agonists, the thiazolidine dions for instance, or the new class of FGF21s that are on the market, not yet on the market, but that will potentially make it to the market, have very potent ceramide lowering effects. And these ceramide lowering effects are associated with an increase in adiponectin levels a mandated increase of adiponectin levels along with improvements in insulin sensitivity. The last aspect that I want to discuss in this context is fat tissue as an unexpected source for critical metabolites and I will develop a little story around uridine which is a classical building block involved in almost every biosynthetic reaction in the system but it turns out that fat tissue at least in the fasted state is a very prominent source for uridine production and that has a broad range of physiological implications with respect to insulin sensitivity, with respect to obesity and ultimately as a therapeutic area with respect to weight loss by enhancing the ability of the fat cell to produce more uridine. Uridine then as a building block can be diverted into the system and ultimately actually released from the system as a source of excess calories. So we are quite excited about some of the new data that is emerging in that area, not just in the area of lipid, uh, homeostasis, inflammation, ceramides and sphingolipids, which are emerging therapeutic areas, but also in the area of these new biosynthetic pathways that are just emerging now as we delve further into it.